episode 5 of the Performance Roundtable podcast. Today we have John Hale, who is a sports engineer, currently doing his PhD, focused on footwear in tennis. The Ask a Researcher series objective is to provoke the minds of both coaches and researchers to critique their own practice. Although the focus of John's work was on the effects footwear has on the athlete's ability to slide and how the court, different court services affect this, the principles can be applied to numerous areas, such as how do we choose footwear during training based off the service area we're using, the session outcomes, and the athlete's ability and movement cap- capabilities. It's always a pleasure to speak to former teammates. So on that, let's begin the podcast. So hello and welcome to the podcast. Today we have on John Hale. He's a good friend of mine and he's going to talk to me about his research. So hi, John. Yeah, hi, you're right, Adam. Good to see you again. Yeah, good, mate. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself, what you're currently doing yeah, sure. and what you've done, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, I'm currently doing a PhD at University of Sheffield. Um, and that PhD is in um, the friction of footwear it's sponsored by the International Tennis Federation and uh, UK Research um, and Innovation. And um, before that, I did my undergraduate at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, that was in sports technology. Um, it was um, my uh, head of um, the module then, Tom Allen, um, is, is quite well known in the field as well. He's now um, editor of Sports Engineering Journal. And then I moved from there into this Centre for Sports Engineering Research, um, where I did my master's before moving across the road quite literally to University of Sheffield to do this PhD where I'm at now. And I've got a few months left um, before I kind of reevaluate my options and see see what the next steps are. But yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, so nice, nice simple sort of degree, um, mm. master's, PhD, the, the normal yeah. route. The standard route. Yeah. The standard route, yeah. Um, yeah. So do you want to talk about the study you're currently doing or the broad sort of study and then sort of the projects you're currently looking at at the moment? Yeah, so the PhD study came about because the International Tennis Federation... Um, is the the governing body for tennis. Um, And within tennis of recent years, you've seen um, players like Djokovic, Nadal, sliding across hard courts. And this is something that, um, you know, media has loved and it's got a lot of attention because it's quite a dramatic movement. Um, And this is actually a movement that comes from clay court tennis where the surfaces are lower friction. And so the International Tennis Federation wanted to know how are athletes performing these movements on hard courts, which are hard courts are essentially just made of uh, sand and, and paint and they're really rough, like sandpaper kind of texture. So how are these players performing these movements and does their shoes have anything to do with it? Um, and so I've been looking into that and looking at, well, what about a shoe makes it high or low friction? Um, you know, is it the tread pattern? You know, so those outsole designs that you'll see on the bottom of any pair of trainers you have, um, or is it the rubber that they're using? And in reality, it's a combination of both. Um, but at the moment, I'm trying to understand that. But it, it's kind of led me into this this area that I found there isn't much research at all on, which is rubber footwear. So, like the trainers you'll walk, you'll wear down to the shops or that you'll wear in the gym or playing sport, basketball, anything like that. What does the tread pattern, um, well, how does it influence friction? And I find there's there's really not much on that. There's a lot which says different tread patterns, different shoes produce different friction, um, but nothing really says why or how. So, so I've kind of gone back to the science of it and starting from, you know, those fundamental things to try and figure out what it is and, and it has big implications because there's a lot of studies which show that in basketball american football in futsal um that show if your shoe has a higher friction than another then you're going to perform movements like stepping movements much quicker um st- significantly quicker um and so it's an important field that i, I just f- think we don't yet understand so i'm just trying to help you know, understand that field a bit better, really. No, so like in sort of the sort of sports science uh, area at the moment, in terms of like not footwear, but the foot is going massive in terms of like more and more sort of people are focusing on how the foot works and that is is when you're root to the floor. Mm. So it makes sense from a a 
engineer's point of view that um, the footwear is where you start. I know there's a lot of work on sort of like jerseys and like the grip on mm-hmm. jerseys and stuff like that, but uh, it's quite interesting to see because we just assume that um, these big companies just do this sort of friction or track yeah. what they use for a, a reason. This is their ink. And yeah. You're going to correct me if I'm wrong, but it could just be because they like that design or... Yeah, I, I think you're completely right. I mean, when when you think about... Um, I wonder if I've got a shoe here with it on. Maybe not. Not to hand anyway. But the a kind of common design that you see on footwear is this kind of wavy design on the bottom. And that's on the bottom of um, Stan, um, Stan Smith, I think. No, Superstars. I did a Superstars. Loads of tennis footwear have them. Um, you see kind of there's a groovy texture to that. Yeah. On the yeah, so that kind of weaving pattern is really common throughout footwear, especially tennis footwear as well and basketball. Now, there's nothing in the research which suggests that's a a better pattern than another. Now, it might be that shoes have done like shoe companies, Nike, Adidas, have done their own tests and think "Mm, we're going to go with this. This is better. But the only thing I've ever seen was actually that that pattern created a lower friction on a basketball court. This was a study by a Nike engineer a long time ago now, one of the first on this kind of thing, showed that it gave them a lower friction than um, a pattern of kind of circular designs or or just flat completely. So you're completely right that I think companies, either for aesthetic, they look at designs that look nice, um, or they're running their own tests, which they don't publish the results, and then no one's to know any any better. Um, that says, oh, well, this shoe is better than another, this design is better than another. And on that, with sort of the way, so I say like a big company like Nike or something like that, is that a lot of people, like the shoes I had, like where the people that are watching on, listening on Spotify or any of the sort of stream yep. platforms, yep, I, did get my, I did get my shoe up. So that's yeah, why yeah. When, he, when he said you see the pattern, I had a yeah, shoe. Yeah, yeah. Makes, <laughs> makes some more sense if you're watching on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, but is a lot of people wear like them shoes there, they are my kind of casual like I coach them sometimes for the indoor stuff, but yep. my casual around the house or going to the shop sort of shoes. So yep. aesthetics are kind of more important for a company like that. Uh, so I think we see when you see sort of the, no one wears the um, the running ones, the, we mm-hmm. not there, like the flies. Or, yeah, vapor flies. Yeah. No one wears them to the shops. No. Do you know what I mean? Well, so, yeah, we, we wouldn't need to pay that much for yeah. their shoes to wear. So I do think that, I know they are you know, more and more, but mm-hmm. there is needs to be a divide between aesthetically uh, replicated sport shoes mm-hmm. and shoes that are made for sport. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the time the technologies from elite sport trickle down into wearable technology. I mean, a lot of, sh- you know, if you talk about um, like Air Max, so these air bubbles in shoes, you know, that started as an innovation for Nike to, to be a performance innovation, you know, for, for extra cushioning, during certain movements, running, whatever it be. Now, that then captured the culture on footwear and people like the look of it, and it becomes a cultural thing as opposed to an an aesthetic thing as opposed to performance. Now, you know, if I mean, Nike now have, you know, um, developed their kind of air air cushioning technology, so it's still being used in performance footwear. But, yeah, these things do trickle down, and whether they're needed or not, you know, is one thing how they look as you walk to the shop but also how they look as you perform the sport you know if you're an elite athlete you want the shoe that's going to work the best but you don't want it to look ridiculous you know there's a whole psychology around does it look good yeah do I look good performing this sport and playing good as a result and um so it looks is still definitely important yeah, yeah there's always that one brand I'm not going to say the brand but if I say it and everyone that's played rugby knows the brand that the props and the coaches wear. I think. Uh, yeah, it's normally a, a, it's normally a nice a black, black plain shoe. <laughs> um, and it's what props and coaches wear. It's probably 15 pounds sports direct. Um, <laughs> yeah. They don't look the best, but like, props don't care. But yeah, there's yeah. definitely, if you're on the main stage, these elite athletes, like mm. you're your own billboard. Yeah, that's it. If you're walking around with Crocs on your feet, I know they're, yeah. they're in trend now, but yeah, they are. I, yeah. um, it, sometimes you've got to look at it at your image from that standpoint. And yeah, you're right. Yeah. So like I said, it's, it's important to see, is this hurting performance or improving performance? But mm-hmm. from someone that works with athletes that do with like a variety of different, um, so m- multiple athletes in one sort of setting, yeah. 
less likely to control footwear and he's normally picked off what looks good. Yeah, I mean, that's completely right. And, and I think it's kind of part of that is because there isn't a lot of, especially with rubber soled footwear like basketball shoes, whatever else, there isn't a lot of research out there that is independent research. You know, it's either sponsored by Adidas, sponsored by Nike, whoever. And that's all well and good, but it, it does mean that as a, and also the issue is actually really complicated, especially with friction, the issue of figuring out whether one shoe is going to have a better frictional performance than another is really complicated and, and it'll be hard for a consumer currently to get an understanding of why one would be better than another and pick it. I, I mean, it mostly comes down to in the consumer at the moment, comfort, perceived comfort when they put on the shoe in the store, if, when you could go to a store um, and appearance and, um, and so I guess that's why a lot of these companies really have to push on those two things. Um, performance, obviously, for elite athletes is, is number one, really. And, um, and so when research comes out about a certain shoe having performance impact, like effect, it is often really taken up um, by these elite athletes for a time anyway. Yeah, and it's, like I said, but having one is to get the funding for these sort of studies, you need mm. the backing of a company to fund them. So, yeah. So it is hard that kind of we need the study, but the study is not going to be impartial. Exactly. We, yeah. It will. Well, yeah, it will be impartial, but it's going to have that sort of no, no connotation of it might not be because it's funded by that company. Yeah, and and I think when you when you've been looking at this kind of research for long enough, you can pick out the studies that are very controlled and very rigid regardless of whether at the end it says sponsored by you know whoever um and you you can take those studies as they are i mean i'm in a, a lucky position where it's sponsored by a governing body so the tests we're running at the moment we've got um i think eight different shoes you know high like um top level shoes for um, hardcore tennis, and we've got Nike, Asics, um, Adidas. We've got a decathlon shoe in there. So we're able to test across brands and really compare. It's rare you get that comparison. You, you know, if you've got a Nike study, for example, you might be comparing an old. So the Nike studies on the um, the Vaporfly 4%, you know, were comparing their new shoe to their old shoe. So we can see their progression not often they did do one against another issue as well but it's not often that multiple brands are being compared in the same picture because i guess it could turn around the other way and say oh well ours weren't as good as um but you can find those studies as i said certain research groups like um center for sports engineering research where i did my masters they've worked with loads of companies and we're you know testing loads of different um sports equipment options in footwear and anything else you could think of really. Um, and yeah, it's just about finding the funding for the project and, and being able to compare across yeah, all those different companies. Yeah, you're not going to get that um, Big Mac, um, K um, back to the Burger King advert where they kind of like, yeah, yeah, joke you like, this is actually a better one. Yeah, yeah. It backfired massively, but um, that's why I think, that's why I wanted to do your sort of podcast is, is the, this knowledge, like for me, it's new to me, mm. but to an athlete that is literally not that inclined, they will never hear this information. So they're just going off what so-and-so yeah. is wearing above them. Yeah. Um, so just having someone like yourself on that, obviously is an expert in this field or coming to be an expert in this field. Yeah. yeah. Um, give me a few years. Yeah, give me a few years, you'll be there. Um, is, is you need to the coaches to come and go, well, actually, are we looking at our footwear? Yeah, is this something we can just have a little dabble in the research? Speak to people like yourself. Yeah, like I know there's I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who are willing to give time to sports teams. Yeah, uh, just to give some advice. Uh, yeah, and and it's just about seeking out those those researchers. I mean, I read a a study recently which was on studded footwear, which is slightly different to mine because you're looking at traction as opposed to friction. In that, you know, you have studs indenting into the ground, and that kind of brings up a a lot of different mechanisms for friction as opposed to just flat rubber on a surface. But 
that was a research group in Norway. Um, and they'd kind of come up with this idea of the spacing between your studs and the layout um, affects the friction. And there's, they have quite a nice idea for it. Um, it's in quite a nice paper they wrote up, um, I think, in 2013, so a while ago now. But that's something where their findings probably could be quite easily transitioned into coaching. You know, like you're saying about props wearing, they wear those old black, they cannot be colourful because um, yeah. then they get um, the mick taken out of them. But, um, you know, that those old school style of six studs, for example, two at the back, four in the four foot, is that the best foot in a scrum, you know, where you need a lot of friction or traction at that interface? Because if there isn't, your foot's sliding out. And obviously that depends on weather conditions a lot. But, you know, there's studies out there that suggest you could pick a boot that has a, a better pattern of studs to make you perform better in the scrum. Um, so there is stuff out there that could <laughs> be linked. But again, those bodies have to join up. You have to join those researchers with the clubs, with the players and kind of host some kind of studies, I think. Yeah, it's best if you're a scrum specialist as well. Like, best in, I know Union's going away from the scrum a bit, mm. but like a South African team that is a big scrum yeah. style team, like that, like that could be massive. Um, yeah. And they might do use them boots just out their own. Like, I think you mentioned off there about certain players testing their own shoes, but they yeah. might do that just by doing it, or they might actually yeah, know sure. these are the best ones. So that would be quite interesting to see what other coaches are doing white footwear wise. I yeah. said to you off air, we, when I work in the gym with athletes, I try and get them to avoid them sort of pillow shoes, the, yeah. the, air, the air max or the vapor max. Yeah. Um, just because they just don't look right. I haven't looked at any studies behind it. I know what you mean. Yeah. But when I ever, I've been on sort of cushiony shoes like that, they don't feel nice in a squat. Yeah. If I can choose between a flat foot, a lifter or sort of like a Nike Metcon or sort of the Reebok Nano sort of style shoe, yeah, I just feel a lot more comfortable, more stable in them. Well, I think I think stability is is something to have a concern about, especially in the gym, because those running shoes, which are now become the norm, really, of these these thick midsoles um, with really soft foams, and often they have some kind of carbon fiber plate in or something now, or plastic plate, but they're really good for linear forward movement. So they're designed for running, you know, long distances. Um, and they provide cushioning for that and also, you know, some kind of energy return. At least that's how, what these carbon fiber things are made for. But as soon as you start stepping, you, you essentially got this height and it, it's just kind of mechanics that you're more likely to kind of turn over. On a, It's like, if you think of an extreme example, like on stilts, you know, if you try and step sideways, your foot's going over. So in squats, I guess you're not moving, but you get a lot of instabilities. So maybe. Um, so I, I would say that's the only thing with with being in the gym and wearing these kind of shoes. You know, shoes do have their, at least, you know, elite ones like that are made with a certain function in mind. And as you change the function, um, it's it's not always that that shoe is still going to perform well, if you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. Like I, I don't think the fly material. Yep. I've got a pair of Nike React Fly Knits. Mm -hmm. Now I love running them. I, yep. You might tell me they're awful, but I like running them. I feel like a cushion. But yeah. whenever I do sort of like lateral movements, because the fly knit, it feels comfortable, but it's not really supported. Okay. Yeah. I find my sh my foot does slide around a bit in them. Mm -hmm. Um, not so much the them ones, but I've got another pair of fly knits that I just can't do lateral movements in. They don't feel great. I feel yeah. like my feet are on the edge of the. the yeah. Well, well, this is the tricky thing, though, with all shoe companies. It's like, the because fit sounds like a problem in that as well, that you're you're looking at um, your foot moving around in the shoe. So how tightly does the, sh the fit, or how tight is the fit already? And there's stuff about people tend to pick sizes that, like, aren't actually their correct size if you were to measure up their foot. So there's one thing in that. And also these big companies, they they have to make a shoe in a size UK 10, let's say, that would fit almost anyone who buys it who's, who foot is of size 10. And everyone's foot is so different. And even throughout the day, you know, your foot varies in size, um, you know, from when you wake up to when you go to bed, your foot can change significantly in size, whether you've sat down for a long time, whether you've been on your feet. So 
these shoes that are made for the masses as such have this real problem of can we consider everything Adam's going to do today in this shoe and make sure it performs well for that. That's a really difficult task. And, and some shoes will work better for the people. Like with you, if you find that fly and it doesn't give you enough support, then I guess that's maybe your way of walking or change direction might be slightly different to another who love it. And that's the tricky thing is, you know, people have their favorites for whatever reason, be it their biomechanics or their psychology. Well, I've got, I've got weird hobbit feet, about size 12 feet. So <laughs> oh, really, that's, that's your uh, problem. You know, yeah, really wide feet. Yeah. Um, so it never helps. Uh, yes, that is one of my own issues. Like, yeah. <laughs> really wide feet. When I, when I went skiing, I have to have got custom made. <laughs> I robbed my dad's so dad got the same feet as me. So I robbed his ski boots. He thought oh, well. custom made just because we have weird feet. <laughs> Not, <laughs> when I say weird, it's being wide. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, probably like a size 12 width. 11 to 11 and a half length uh, yeah and then i've got a quite a high arch yeah so it's yeah. kind of a weird quite hard to get the right yes, shape yeah, yeah, yeah i think i would but when i went when i were timberlands i was like a, i think i was like a uk 10 or 10 and a half. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. it's really weird so yeah i get what you're saying it's probably my fault the shoes are <laughs> <laughs> um but no so with this research mm. sorry yeah with this research in this what is the current i know we spoke about a bit but what is yeah. the current body of research yeah so the current but in terms of friction of footwear in general is that it the higher friction tends to in the studies tested and the, the kind of levels of friction tested the higher friction improves performance of certain movements um but at the same time you get this kind of contrary kind of negative thing coming up of well high friction surfaces and shoes can induce kind of overuse injuries. You know, if you're stepping on really hard, you know, that have no give surfaces with your really high friction shoes, the loading to your joints over time um, can lead to these overuse injuries. It, it's obviously hard in research to make clear links between injuries and some kind of technology implementation because these injuries, as you'll know, take time to develop it's not often one just event that happened and oh there we go he's injured but it's it's repetitive so there is research which suggests that um the friction of surfaces is linked to injuries obviously but how concrete that is um is yet to really be decided in in some sports but so so we know really that friction let's say in tennis um well, in tennis, again, it's tricky that this is why my whole study is going on is because people are sliding on these hardcore surfaces now, which implies a low friction. And it's not so much that it's just that the athlete kind of contorts their body in a way. And if you see it, if you watch any videos of Djokovic, for example, sliding, he's so low to the floor, then his legs at such a, an angle that really there's hardly any normal load on that, on that um, shoe. So it's all lateral load. So he's still, he's just forcing this slider, this high friction surface. So, so the, the research then comes back to, well, looking at that interaction of the shoe on the surface, what do we know about it? And in wet conditions, we know a lot. We know that the tread on those shoes. So the stuff you were showing earlier, um, that displaces fluids between that would have been between your shoe and the floor. And if there is fluid there, and it's not displaced, you slip. Um, and this has happened in numerous sports. There's loads of examples. But so you do need tread for wet environments. But when you're talking indoor tennis, you're talking basketball, really there shouldn't be any fluids on the surface. So why do we still have the tread? And, and that is where the evidence is missing because there really isn't much at all that tells us why that is. Um, the one thing could be, well, you know, for me or you buying a shoe that we wear to the gym, chances are we're going to be wearing it outside at some point. We might, you know, there's different environments. So you need to account for whether there is any fluid contamination. You don't want to just slip suddenly. Um, but in terms of tread on dry surfaces, there really isn't much research. There's a group in Japan doing some fundamental stuff um, there with ASICs, actually. So they're researching it, but other than them 
and ourselves at Sheffield, I, I haven't really seen anything. Um, research we do know is about, you know, rubber in general. So a simple rubber block on a, on a surface, you know, can we define the friction of that? And, and there's a lot of work from that being done in tire industries, because that's obviously a huge issue with them. So it's about, and this is often the case with sports engineering is it's about picking the research from these different fields and saying, well, how is that useful to us? Uh, because that, that's what sports engineering is really. There's complex problems in dynamic situations and to solve them, you often need to kind of call on expertise. It might be fluid dynamics and, and things like that, or it might be mechanics of mater and material characteristics. So at the moment, we have a few of these fields, but they yet to kind of come together to tell us which shoe, especially with rubber shoes, rubber sole shoes, which most are, which are better than others for certain purposes. Yeah, so a lot to unpack there. Mm, yeah. Is just again, I'm not I'm not really worked in tennis or basketball, so uh, but with sort of basically basketball, a lot of players, whether Jordans and stuff like yeah. that, is do you find maybe the tread on their one because it's they're not like with rugby, you have a rugby boot, yeah, that you would just wear just for rugby. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's true. Just because Jordans are such so for example, Jordans are multi purpose. Yep. Um like I said before, is in terms of having a match Jordan and a street Jordan, that yeah. like I'm not going to pitch that tonight because it's, yeah, yeah. you didn't listen to me, <laughs> but uh, maybe that could be one of the reasons behind why they wear it because they don't just wear it for the game. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you do get, I mean, there has been this kind of street ball shoes where they kind of change the shoe in that they pick a a grade of rubber that doesn't wear as easily because obviously you're playing outside on concrete and rougher surfaces. So they, they have, there are changes like that that are occasionally made, but with the tread patterns themselves, yeah, they're multi-purpose shoes, but again, that has been kind of by design of their Nike's marketing company or whoever, rather than the designers. When I believe, especially with the earlier, well, with the kind of performance models of, Jordans or whatever they are, um, the Nikes, Adidas, whatever. Performance is always at the forefront because ultimately they have professional athletes here who need to feel they're playing when they shoe. And if the professional athlete isn't wearing it, the kid on the street isn't buying it. Um, so I'm not sure if they're thinking, you know, you know, when Tink Hatfield was designing the, the, you know, nth Jordan, I'm not sure he was there thinking, okay, I need to make sure when the kid is playing in outside that this shoe also performs well. He's just thinking, can we get Michael Jordan to play well and look good in this shoe, really? Um, but yeah, they have become multi-purpose, of course. Has there ever been an epidemic of a certain footwear just ruining athletes? Mm. Um, I don't know if you know one of that or... Mm, I don't, that's you don't, interesting. You don't really need to name drop the shoe, just... Yeah. Yeah. Um, not so much where you get a shoe come through and then there's a lot of really bad press suddenly and then it's like, oh, that, that doesn't happen so much. I think often you get some shoes and personally, I like Adidas for this. that They, they often take risks with their footwear. So they had a shoe come out where, I don't know if you remember it, but they, it was called the spring blade and it was all like little blades instead yes, of a yes. midsole. And People didn't really pick that up because of the aesthetic of it. But it was an interesting design because they kind of thought, well, how can we propel a runner a bit? Could we have some kind of blades on the shit, on the foot, get rid of the midsole completely, which has been there for how long and is a staple of the shoe now to have some kind of foamy, rubbery midsole. Mm. Um, and that shoe obviously hasn't taken off. You, I mean, you wouldn't see it. I mean, I, I'm not sure I ever saw anyone wear it. Yeah. Um, but you do get shoes like that that really tried something new and innovative and didn't quite pull off. And I think the reason we don't have a lot of shoes that are instantly rejected for bad performance is because there is a degree of safety within a lot of, you know, shoe manufacturers where it's like, okay, we need, we should have this, we should have this and innovate within those kind of regions. But as I said, you do get the occasional one pop up as kind of like a side project. I mean, there was also, um, I did ask really early, did um, the micro pacer, which, 
had you know it would track it had a pedometer in it and it yes, would track your yes. steps and that was before nike free then did a similar thing years later the, the adidas micropace it didn't really it's a bit of a cult classic but it didn't really take off amongst i mean runners weren't wearing that because it's like a little computer and you should it's just yeah. weight essentially but um but they're things where although that product at the time i don't know the numbers how much they sold maybe it was huge in germany or russia or something who knows but but the little innovations tried uh, you know may not have worked first time but then later find their place so um so i wouldn't say there's one particular i think when you first said that about a, a product that you know went awry the first thing that came to mind was actually another sports engineering thing being do you remember the Jabulani football that was used in the World Cup? Yeah, yes, in yes, South yeah, Africa, it, and it flew weird. And yeah, yeah. Bib didn't like it. That, that's something where, I mean, they had engineers and scientists work on that for a long time. And then in practice, no one liked, like, well, no one liked it. There was the odd person who maybe liked it. But the, the unanimous verdict was, we don't like because it doesn't do what it used <clears> to do. Yeah. Um, and that's an interesting one because they went for innovation. The, the ball was more um, spherical than any other. They'd kind of worked in getting this kind of bonded technology of all the panels to make sure it was really spherical compared to other footballs, which is really hard to do. And they were like, that's great. And then because of that, the flight dynamics, how it trips um, laminar air into turbulent was, was just off compared to what players were used to. And um, I mean, we, we spoke about early in coaching about some players are just used to doing a certain thing and therefore want it to carry on like that. And when an innovation comes in, be it in coaching or in footwear, in technology, there's often that resistance because they're not used to doing it. And therefore, I've done this, this for this long. That's how it's going to stay. So the technology has reached that kind of case as well. Well, I was on a smaller scale in terms of like it wasn't really engineering, but but being, being playing both rugby union and league, the ball is different. Yep. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. when you, when you're more like cross code, like I play in a pro same as you, we, mm -hmm. we were both playing bulldogs and going to yep. union. Mm -hmm. It's kind of you get not getting used to the one ball, whereas if you do like a long periods of time, yeah, um, that first if you went playing league all your life and went to union, mm. imagine like. We, bad enough for me but for that change yeah i always found it's weird float better um yeah yeah that that's i mean i yeah i've never really thought so much about that but it did definitely for me i went from union to league and i do remember holding these balls thinking like there's something different about this yeah. <laughs> i couldn't quite figure out what it was but but yeah in fact on that note just a side thing um so i'm part of what we call the human interactions group at Sheffield. So we do lots of engineering that's related to human. So we do skin, we do, we've got a, a PhD going on in padding and footwear, you know, like shoulder padding and if that actually works and what it prevents, but they did a whole thing on ball grip actually. And you know, the dimples on the ball, the little rubber ones, you know, looking at different amounts of them and what's best for what conditions, et cetera. Um, so there is stuff going on around rugby balls, but I would like to know now what the actual difference actually is between those two types of balls. Cause I still, I haven't figured it. There's something definitely about the shape, but I don't know if there's anything else. I always thought the union ones a bit stompier and a bit route, like not bigger, but like plumper. Yeah. And then league were a bit more like torpedoey. Now <laughs> is I that a technical, yeah, that is the, the sports engineer of myself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I could tell. But uh, but obviously you was a lot better player than me. So oh no, don't say that. You probably felt less difference. Oh, I need all the time. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Before we go back onto footwear, I remember the one ball. It was uh, I think it was Steeden ball. Yep. And in the dry, on the best balls you ever used, it was just yeah. so grippy. Oh, I know. It yeah. got wet and it was awful. It was literally. Yeah. I think it was a Steeden one. I, I think mm -hmm. If it wasn't, I'm sorry, Steeden. I'm sure you're listening. <laughs> yeah. Um. It was we had it for this one tournament, and as soon as you got wet, it was like a bar of soap. Yeah, that's the excuse I'm using. Uh, yeah. But no, no, I know. Yeah, it was really weird. Like it was dry. It was like you're saying, but like tread patterns. But like, yeah, exactly. It, yeah. In the dry, it was amazing. Like you just stick. But as yeah. soon as that got wet, it was just awful. Well, you that is exactly the thing with tread patterns as well, because really, in a completely dry 
environment you don't want any tread at all if you wanted really high friction you'd want the the shoe as flat just a flat piece of rubber so if you think about climbing shoes for example they don't have any tread on but they need really high friction to the point where you're holding yourself up on a wall and if you think about f1 tires so in dry environment like when it's dry out on the surface they pick the the flat tire because it's got the best friction and also rolling resistance which is an issue with that um but as soon as it becomes wet that flat is it's it's worse than anything because you're just going to slip it's almost a sure thing so yeah that's the same with the ball and they've obviously got to figure out a way to design those in a way where you have that old, real nice grip in dry and it's not as slip i mean maybe you're making it sound worse than it was but it's not a bar <laughs> of soap in the wet at the same time yeah, I get that. It's an excuse I use. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Blame the equipment. Yeah, he's, he probably was grippy. I just can't pass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so we went on a bit of a tangent there, but all this stuff, sport, sport science, all this stuff is all really new. So all these things are just kind of part and part of the parcel, which where we will have to try and error sort of thing. But it is coming to nature now where more t- practitioners, more engineers, whatever, whatever sort of environment are looking at other sports. Yeah, and yeah. that's what I always found um, useful coming from an outsider into, like, so from rugby to football, is I've seen things differently. So I'm not relying on my past playing experience yeah. to go, oh, we, we used to do this drill, let's do this drill again. Yeah, and um, you really have to do an in-depth sort of analysis on the subject. So yeah, you come with, well, yeah, you come with no bias. Yeah, I completely agree, and I think that is sometimes an issue. Like when I came into this project on tennis. I wasn't a tennis player. Um, I watched Wimbledon, but that, that was probably about it at the time. Now I've got a little bit more, I'm a bit more invested in it, but, um, but I hadn't. And I think often that works in your favor as an engineer, because as you said, you have to see it from a kind of factual standpoint. There, there's often preconceptions in sport. And when you've been in that sport for a long time, you develop these preconceptions, which are kind of, not backed by any science so it might be that you know a certain prop i must wear this boot i've worn it for ages or the the props above me wear it therefore and and that stints that stunts um development and uh and so when you come into you know a sport like tennis and you're investigating how players are able to do what they're able to do and the footwear they're using if you're not already in it you can really take a scientific approach to looking at that and separating yourself from the sport itself so no i completely agree with you on that and on sort of that sort of that approach is how are you currently using this research i know you're saying you work with certain companies yeah um how are you sort of applying it and how would you apply it if you was in another sport knowing what you know yeah i think um the whole my findings have essentially come down to when you're looking at rubber footwear you do need to understand the surface it's on characterize that correctly so it's going to be different for basketball it's going to be different for tennis indoor football it's going to be different again um and not just to think well this tread pattern is used in basketball and all these top players love it so we're going to use it on tennis because you're talking of a different different speeds different surfaces which require different levels of friction and different movements so i would say it's about um knowing i mean the science behind it as i said is is relatively complicated because rubber as a material is much more complicated than we think and when you pick different all these different pairs of shoes will have different grades of rubber with different things in them different chemical compositions which alter their effects so at the moment the research is very much in a in a somewhat theoretical stage i think in the future, we could quite easily, to, to where this project is at the moment, we could quite easily progress it to saying, well, can we, you'd need a shoe manufacturer, but can you manufacture some shoes with designs that we predict from our looking at the science and those studies that we predict would be good friction and bad? And can we have players actually test them and see if it does? Because it's one thing to have it being high friction in a lab and and that has shown in a lot of studies to correlate well with player performance this 
lab tested for where you essentially have a shoe and you drag it along essentially um, but because players perform movement so differently different areas of the shoe will be in contact with at different times you know different speeds so my stuff is very lab based i think in the future test some of the theory with athletes and see how they respond to it it may be that they they notice these frictional improvements and then my research can move on to development of shoe treads that improve performance in a in a, a range of sports or it may be that they don't and then you have to rethink um, but i could see it moving into actual shoe tread design yeah so in a few years you're gonna have hails heels yeah uh, with a 3d printer yeah, I, yeah yes. i've painted that idea yeah, already. yeah. No. <laughs> yeah I, th- I think um the, the tricky thing is with footwear said is that there are huge companies in it and it and it is really quite an expense even to get a prototype out so anyone who was planning to create their own shoe company need a lot of money behind them so ideally it would be working with some of these shoe companies to to at least you know manufacture some prototypes and just see if our kind of findings do relate to to real footwear on on athletes um but but the science is is there and it's developing and i think in the next how many years we're going to get tread patterns that are more scientifically informed and not just oh we've always used this pattern therefore i think we are going to start seeing that developing and and you know a, a refinement to improve performance yeah definitely yeah, it's what I've seen with sort of these Nike, especially Nike, they're quite proactive. Yeah. They are actively looking for that edge in performance. Like you can see with what they're doing with the running shoes in terms of just yeah. flies. So an ideal world, they will be looking at this research themselves. I'm sure they've got, mm. their, like you said before, their own technology, tech, yeah. uh, engineers, not technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Engineers uh, working on this. Yeah. And make it, well, they, they already have performance, but start implementing these ideas and, yeah, I, I mean, for, for shoe companies, it, it is massive because, you know, we're, we're talking about the Nike Vaporfly now, yeah, because that's made the news and everyone knows about it, performance improvements. Mm-hmm. If you go back with Adidas, for example, when Adidas was first starting up, um, Adi Dazzler, the, the founder, he, he was essentially, he was making shoes himself by hand. And one of his main ideas uh, links to this World Cup final the Germans called it Wunder von Bern, where it was like, it was like our 1966, really, where Germany won the World Cup against all odds. And the story with Adidas behind that is that he designed a, sh- a boot, which is normal now across, I mean, everyone has seen these, where you could undo the studs and put in different studs if you needed. And in this game, the weather got really bad and the Germans put in their longer studs they win the game against the Hungarians, who are the favourites, and everyone was looking like, "Well, it's these these boots, you know." Like that's what everyone says. It's oh, it wasn't the great German players who played their hearts out, which of course it was. But and that that kind of publicity for a shoe company launches it to the point it's at now with Nike. You know, it gets it a lot of um, publicity. So it is really important to these shoe companies to have innovations that actually work and improve performance just for their sales of of shoes that aren't even related it just makes them more in the conversation but it's just like with this, keep going back to the overflies but i've seen mm-hmm. so many not even competitive athletes like just, just local runners yeah. that have bought these vapor flies um because one of the going to do a marathon in like a few months so i don't want to do a good time yeah it's madness when you think about it but it's it, and a good, in one sense it's the first time that it's not just clickbait uh yeah. snake oil salesman it's actual evidence so that, that's yeah good. yeah that's what that's the dream surely for a salesman is that you're giving evidence that is um, as supported well you know it's supported there's studies that support it um and yeah and everyone wants to run faster really let's be honest so if a shoe says it's going to do it you'll buy it yeah um, that's great. I really appreciate you coming on. So the last question I asked one of my guests is, yep. um, who would you like to see on the podcast in the future? That could be someone that you respect in research wise, mm. could be in a field you completely different to yours. Yeah. Uh, or it could just be a topic for a round table discussion mm. uh, in a certain area. Yeah. Well, in terms of people I respect, I mean, 
I said, I've been really lucky that from my undergrad through, I've had supervisors who are real experts in my field and know so much more than me. At the moment, I've got Professor Matt Carey, um, who's got 20 years in the field. And um, before that, people like Marcus Dern at Hallam and, um, and Tom Allen. So I've been really lucky. And they're people who really know this kind of stuff beyond beyond me just just with their levels of experience but this I, I think an area that I would like to hear about more is sports psychology and especially of the, the coaches themselves because a lot of people get told about sports psychology of you the individual as the athlete you know before you go out there to think about you know that mental rehearsal of being successful but for me in my when I was at Eagles or at Salford the coaches were a certain way and that rubs off on the players if it's you know we at so no actually I'll say it, at Eagles we had this very much mentality of don't mess up and that really brought a lot of us to to play within yourself a bit and not play expansive rugby when I was at Bulldogs and we were you know just playing for the fun of it you know I would I would you know take risky options and and you play better as an option because that confidence so so I think I would like to hear about sports psychology and coaching and how much it's considered from a coach's perspective on the athlete so if you know anyone like that I don't know anyone in that field but that would be interesting I definitely have a little dive into that again I could do a really interesting sort of a uh, psychologist and a technical coach on the podcast Mm -hmm. and see how they do their reflection how they work with each other um, but what you kind of say there was that Pinky was a better coach at Pinky Bulldogs. Well. Um, what a I, great guy, Pinky! Yeah, was. Good, I had good, to good bloke, him. good bloke, yeah. Pinky. Yeah. So, yeah, no. But thanks for coming on. No, uh, thanks for having honestly, me. I've, I learned so much just listening. Um, it made me think about like, just having a conversation about footwear before it's kind of a bit of a fad. Yeah. Um, oh, it's just footwear. Wear what's comfy. Yeah, yeah. But it, it can play a role. Yeah, definitely. We've got can. these high performance settings. Like we, we spend so much time looking at increasing our squat by one kg. Yeah. And we could just change, look at footwear and have a better reaction. Yeah. Exactly. That's we have a lot more uh, control. So again, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah. No, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks for listening. If you want to keep up to date with the episodes, see extra clips, or just want to have a chat, then you can follow us on Performance Roundtable Podcast on YouTube, Adam Bromley12 on Twitter. Adam Bromley on LinkedIn or A to B Conditioning on Instagram. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, please get in touch. See you next time.